raise your hand and we'll get round to you. Um, we've got the agenda up, so we'll start off with um, the vaccine COVAX update. Paula, who's um, taken over from Bestfold in terms of running our COVID service, um, is running a little bit late. Um, she's um, come from Open Forest Federation, so hopefully we'll have a la later on so we can introduce her to you. Um, but we'll, Karen will just cover and give us an update on the COVID vaccine. Hi, Karen. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, letting me speak to Paula's hard work. So, um, yeah, as Nadim said, um, we've been really delighted to have Paula join us the last couple of weeks from Waltham Forest. Um, and um, she want, one, we wanted to introduce her to you, but also just to um, update colleagues on where we are with the vaccination programme. Masana, if we just go to the first slide in terms of the vaccination service, thank you. Um, and um, people will know, and I, I guess to a degree, you're probably tired of hearing us saying this, but we, we do need just to keep ploughing on in terms of the vaccine service. Um, and uh, we've um, been able to um, give nearly 150,000 doses across Newham um, in terms of first doses. And uh, the percentage of the population who've received their doses is going up week after week. So you can see, you know, nearly... 56% um, of the population or 55 and a half percent of the population have received a first dose of their vaccination um, and um, the sites in terms of delivery from the Stratford end at Ludwig Gutman and the East Ham end at the Leisure Centre in East Ham seem to be being well received by um, residents um, and we're getting good throughput of people coming through the services. But I guess um, if we just move on, and I think colleagues will have seen some of these um, uh, numbers because I know the Nell team share the the sort of breadth of um, uptake across the northeast London area. But I guess it might be just worth focusing in terms of the PCN geographies, and we do obviously have data um, by practice on exactly what the uptake is in terms of first and second dose. And you can see here sort of by PCN area, it does vary slightly across the borough. Um, uh, and, you know, PCNs and practices may want to look at whether there is anything else that can be done to assist uptake. Um, we can um, support practices that feel they want to do um, practice dispersals. Um, I know some practices have been able to um, run a few clinics. I think we all recognise it hasn't been easy um, because the arrangements that we had to operate previously were every um, clinic had to be on a day by day basis. You had to collect your vaccines from Ludwig Gutmann, you know, at sort of seven o'clock in the morning and so on. We've been able to revise some of those arrangements because the SOPs have changed. So we're now in a position to offer practices a week's supply at a time. Um, and that might influence some practices to feel confident that they could run some clinics. Um, and we're also getting to a place where we will be able to um, support practices to deliver Pfizer as well as AstraZeneca. So I guess it's something for colleagues to think about and we'd be really happy to assist any practices that felt they wanted to explore the opportunity of practice based clinics um, and without getting too um, into the sort of uh, nitty gritty of payments. Obviously, the practices that do their own um, uh, clinics, you will receive the relevant fee um, associated with the DES activity. So it might be something practices would want to consider. If we just move on, Masana, um, a couple of other things that you may have seen information coming out of um, NEL and um, other communication networks, but we have a couple of mass vaccination events lined up. The, these are significantly in response to the Delta variation that you'll have seen on the news and you'll know um, from some of your clinics is starting to have an upsurge in the borough um, and obviously is um, particularly prevalent in the northwest of the country. Um, uh, so we have decided to um, 
run a mass vaccination clinic this weekend at the East Ham Leisure Centre. Um, so Saturday and Sunday, tomorrow and Sunday, um, it is a walk-in clinic. So you don't need appointments. Patients can just turn up. Um, we would be particularly keen to see patients that are aged between 18 and 39. But being candid with you, we're not going to turn anyone away. So if you have patients that would like to receive their first or their second dose of Pfizer, we'll be delivering Pfizer from the East Ham Leisure Centre, um, please do point them in the direction of the East Ham Leisure Centre. We'll be there from eight o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the evening. And we'd be really keen to get a very, very strong turnout in the hope that we can sort of, you know, you know, we're in this race against the uh, Delta variation to try and up the level of vaccinations in that younger cohorts. So I appreciate it's Friday lunchtime and we're talking about this weekend, but hopefully you have had some emails and messaging. And if there are opportunities to share it across your patient networks or um, in conjunction with um, patients and networks that you have, please do encourage them to come to East Ham. As I say, they don't need an appointment. The other mass vaccination event is one that Nell is organising. Um, and we've been helpful in terms of um, arranging staff and so on to support it. And that's next Saturday. So Saturday, the 19th of June. And that's at the London Stadium or the West Ham Football Club, depending on your perspective on this. Um, and uh, this will, is planned to be a mass vaccination event with the um, ambition of vaccinating between 10 and 15,000 people. Um, I think as long as we do over 11,001, which is what the Twickenham level was, we'll be all right. <laughs> so I believe the Twickenham event did about 11,000. So um, uh, the ambition, I think, from Nell is that we must at least do 11,001. But I'm sure colleagues will appreciate it's it's a big undertaking and quite a sizable um, uh, activity. So they are really keen for staff who might be able to um, contribute to the day. Uh, they will pay staff, but equally, if you feel able to volunteer, they're delighted to have you. They need about 400 staff to work, um, both admin, vaccinators, um, people who can marshal queues, who can supervise um, post vaccination observation, etc. I think you should have received communications from Nell. If by any chance you haven't and you're wondering where and what to do, give us a shout and we'll connect you up to the right people. But um, Saturday week uh, at the London Stadium and, you know, it is very definitely open to all patients um, aged 18 and above. And again, that will be a Pfizer vaccination opportunity. Um, that one you need to book, um, but they've got a, a booking arrangement plan through Eventbrite. So rather than the national booking scheme, they're planning to use Eventbrite. Um, I don't have the details of exactly what the link is as yet, but we will make sure that's shared across um, practices and yourselves as soon as we have it. Um, so that's sort of two um, in terms of mass vaccination events. If we just go on, Masana to uh, sorry, Masana to the next. Um, uh, just a quick update on some of the things that we've um, been doing in terms of how we're organising the um, vaccination service. Um, we, as I mentioned, have been able to revise the roving model, so the support to practices because the SOP, the national SOP has changed. And so we are able to support practices to undertake um, clinics we can get your practice booking arrangements up on AccuBook if that's helpful. We've been able to do that recently for Wood Grange, and we can do that to other practices. And as I say, we can potentially offer you a week's supply at a time. We can't extend it beyond a week. Um, the guidelines from the national scheme at the moment are that it has to be used within a week, but it's better than it was. And I'm hoping that that might assist some practices to feel positive. Um, about taking up um, a, a clinic there. 
Um, and then just to say, obviously, we're still continuing to do some work with some of the harder to reach groups. We've got a homeless and rough sleeper pilot going on. We've also got activities with um, uh, those that are housebound, have disabilities, have been um, more disinclined, shall we say, to come and uh, attend at the various vaccination sites. So you know all of those sort of slightly more variable initiatives are carrying on um, alongside the, the the mass vaccination and the general provision and then one just heads up um we're told that the Pfizer supply might be a little bumpy in uh, back end of June early July I never quite know what that means when we get this message it's always a little <laughs> vague that we hear um, that there may be some challenges with Pfizer supply but I guess just to give colleagues the heads up that we may have to manage the quantities that are out in the borough because if our supply is restricted it'll just um, make it slightly um, more challenging for us but um, we will you know be really keen to um, work with practices still and uh, partners if you've got the opportunity to um, participate and be part of the <coughs> dispersal arrangement. So very last slide. I know the last time we met um, was, um, excuse me, coughing. We just did the last slide, Masana. Um, the very last time we met, we talked about 100,000 um, vaccinations being delivered by NHC. At that point, we hadn't delivered 100,000 from the Ludwig Gutmann site, but we now have. So uh, in the last month, effectively, we've done 25,000 um, jabs. So I think, you know, the borough and yourselves should be enormously proud of the, the work that you're able to deliver and, and how many people have uh, got themselves vaccinated. And I will pause there and happy to take questions, Nadine. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that, Karen. So um, East Ham event is a walk-in clinic, um, a walk-in service this Saturday and Sunday. And, and as Karen said, it, we're aiming to do about 5,000, but we, we have a bit more than 5,000 if needed. And next week's NEL event is a pre-booked event, so you can't turn up due to kind of security and policing issues. So Saturday, Sunday this week, our event is um walk-in clinic. It's not bookable, I believe. Is that correct, Karen? Okay, um, Karen, you Yes, the East Ham one tomorrow and Sunday is not bookable, but the NEL event next Saturday you have to book. Sure, and in terms of dispersal, we're actively encouraging practices to do dispersal. You've got the opportunity to start preparing for Pfizer. Um, I mean, and AZ, we can now give a week supply and quite a few of our practices are doing it. I mean, Claire was asking about business as usual and struggling in primary care, but I suppose if, you, if you're struggling with, with business as usual, then it's probably not a great idea to do vaccines. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure practices can make their own decision. And, um, you know, Wax and Woodgrange will be doing lots, so I'm sure they're coping with their workload. Um, I think that probably answers all the questions, really. Um, any, yeah. any kind of comments, Wax, on how it's going with you? Because you're doing weekly pickups now, aren't you, for your AZ? And, I, and I'm sure you're planning Pfizer, aren't you, at Woodgrange? <laughs> I'll, I'll do whatever you can give me. I really enjoy it. I love it. I absolutely enjoy it. I think, you know, from what we've been doing over the years and you know, scratching the surface, 60, 70% in some of these quaffs and all of this dares and lairs and bears and whatever it is. And, you know, we, we know how much of a difference this clearly makes. Uh, and I am just, just really enjoy being involved in it. And especially after the crap time we had last year. Sure. Um, and then it's just really nice to, to to work with everyone. I, you know, I I don't I haven't minded going to SLG and disturbing Helen and Karen and Paula now and Susan and Eleanor in the morning. That's so quite, and and the the patients really love it. That's quite. I mean, as Babu said, some of our practices will come. Some of our patients will come to practices, um, but we've got the option to do more Essex Lodge, Woodgrange pharmacies, and um, East Ham, and also SLG and and. Also, the um, the um, Stratford sites, I think, the park. Yeah. Oh, I just, the, uh, one thing about, I mean, people, uh, yeah, obviously, we worry about staff and stuff like that, but staff, 
when we do audits here, 80 plus percent of the calls or the contact we have with patients is about COVID vaccine. So the staff were so keen that, you know, they just said, well, if, if, we, if, if, that, if we're spending that much time daily doing this, then actually, um, you know, why don't we just go that extra 30 seconds and put it on Pinnacle and actually jab. So it, it makes perfect sense. It's become business as usual here. And it will be business as usual, no matter what anybody says until, you know, winter, until Boris decides to uh, um, uh, change his mind. Uh, we, we were really lucky in terms of resourcing. We've recruited four Kickstart staff. So I don't know whether you all have heard about the Kickstart program. So there are now our COVID champions and I'm hoping to sneak them on to some of those UEL courses to go the whole hog and jab as well. So there's no impact on our regular BAU. In fact, we're free to do some well, of the stuff that's in the tap box. If practice want to do it, then we can put you on actual book like Woodgrange and, and that helps to get patients from outside your practice and yeah. helps with logistics as well. Thanks for that. Um, did, you want me to, Nikki, did, you, did you want me to pick up the questions? I see, Kavito, you just wanted to ask about mixing of vaccines um, and then also um, the when Pfizer will come to practices. Sh shall I just address those? Yep, go for it, Karen. Thank you. Um, so uh, the vaccine mix has not been cleared as yet. We have um, a, a, an understanding from the clinical trials that there's no um, reported um, problems. So there's no reported concerns or issues, but the um, full trial process has not been completed. And so the efficacy of having the two vaccines is not yet fully confirmed. Having said that, the clinical direction around housebound has enabled because a lot of the housebound had Pfizer as their first dose and um, the clinical direction was to enable AstraZeneca to be given as the second dose. Um, but it's not um, completed its clinical trial process. Um, so I appreciate that's a slightly mixed message, um, but that's that's the, the situation. I don't know, Wax, I can see you've got your hand up. You might have more up to date. Can yeah, I mean, the, the mixing stuff, that kind of went a bit loopy, didn't it? So people have had some really, really nasty side effects. And in fact, we had a patient that had Sputnik uh, and then the Pac-Fac as well, and then had an AstraZeneca afterwards. And oh boy, they didn't fare too well. Actually, one had a, a central retinal vein occlusion. So the mixing kind of situation, that's let, let's let, let, let scientists sort that out before we we think about that. Um the uh, the other thing that sort of um, in terms of the Pfizer lumpiness, because um, we've got and you know Paula and Karen and Beth and others and John have managed to get loads of AZ in, we've just nabbed it from everywhere. You know dispersal has been really really much more straightforward. I think as we get lumpy with Pfizer and we will get very lumpy with Pfizer in the next four weeks. You know as much as it pains me to say it the dispersal will be complicated. It becomes much more complex. So, you know, a vial here, a vial there, and you don't, it doesn't really work like that with Pfizer as we know. So I think we'll have to think about that because I think that's that's not, yes, we potentially can be dispersing soon. We can do all the SOPs and stuff like that. But the fact is with the supply so lumpily, it makes things very complicated, I think. We haven't had that issue with AZ, even though the threats of that. But if you're, but if you're keen as a practice, then contact us and we, we can start. Yeah, with definitely. And definitely. second dose issues, I think you just choose the vaccine that's the closest in terms of how it's how how, how it's made. I think is that the question you're asking? You're no, mute. They've had it abroad. There's yeah. sort of just like I mean, if they've had it abroad, how do you document it? Because it's still not going. Even if you put it on the Covax template, it still doesn't go onto Pinnacle. And then the patient's NHS app doesn't reflect it. So it, sure. uh, on, so that's been an issue that's been on the peer group that's coming up quite a lot. Um, is that correct? Is there an, yeah, any I don't know about the app issue, but in terms of the second dose, I think the advice is you choose the vaccine that's closest. So if it's so a kind of... If, yeah, so if they've had their first dose abroad, can we give the second... So some people have been sent away again. Can we give their second dose? You can. Yeah, yeah. at the site. And the other issue is what's coming up is that it's still not 
some of them are still not going on to Pinnacle. So um, it's still not being reflected on Pinnacle and it's not showing up on the NHS app. I don't know if Susanna wants to, Susanna was talking about it on the uh, peer group today. Susanna, do you want to come, do you want to come in? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, I, th I think so. But the problem is it's affecting quite a lot of people. And um, yes, I know the Pinnacle has had its ups and downs, uh, but we can't really deal with this. And I've been saying to all my patients, look, the best we can do for you, because we've recorded it on the COVAC um, template that we can give a printout from the practice that you actually have had the vaccination, but it's not going to be as detailed as the NHS app document. Um, some of them are happy with it, some of them are not so happy with it. I actually had one patient who received Pfizer in SLG but was coded as AstraZeneca. So that's another thing. And I know it's easily, you know, done because I know how busy it is as a vaccinator. And, you know, because you've got a choice of which vaccine you give, you, you might easily click the wrong one. So I know it can happen. But obviously, he's not very happy that, you know, he had to go through all of this to have it removed and then, you know, added on and then still hasn't got it on his NHS app. But, you know, I mean, if that could be somehow. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pass down to Paula to feed up, but some of these are teething issues. Um, and if we're giving kind of hundreds of thousands, there will be errors in terms of whether you put down AZ or omit um, a vaccine. Um, but. In terms of, yes, I think that, that's not really under our direct control, though we can feed it back nationally. Um, Jenny, you've got your hand up. Hi, I have. Thanks, Nadim. I just wanted to come in here. So I think um, the, the, the kind of um, uh, complexity of this vaccination programme means that uh, there are several different IT systems that are being run. So uh, Pinnacle is used to record vaccinations given both in uh, primary care. So by primary care, I mean at the practice or at LVS sites and also for community pharmacy. There is a different IT system called NIMS that is being used uh, for the vaccination centres, the mass vac sites and the hospital hubs. Therefore, if um, a patient presents at the practice having had their vaccination abroad, you can record that in your uh, in your own EMIS system. What you won't be able to do is record that in Pinnacle because you should only be using Pinnacle to record the vaccination that you give at, at the time, and that would be the second dose. Do not attempt to enter that onto Pinnacle because then you would be inadvertently claiming for um, a vaccination that you haven't given. Um, eventually, all of that information from wherever it's flowing in um, will will show um, on, NH on the NHS app. But for um, for some of those vaccinations being done abroad, that will take a bit longer to validate and enter. And so the most up to date version will be what is recorded either in Pinnacle, if that's where patients have had their first their first dose um, or your computer system and the vaccination progress reports that we are pushing out to you once or twice a week will be the information from your EMIS clinical system. Okay, all right. Thanks for that, Jenny. Um, yeah, I think we'll move on from COVID, but uh, there's quite a few questions. I'm not sure we've got the answers of all of them today, and, and there are quite a few issues with the app and so. Um, should we move on to Nazma, who's going to give us um, an update on end of life and the um, identification tool? Is that all right? Hi, Nazma. Thanks, Nadine. Uh, can I have slide number one, please? I think this is a follow on from the previous presentation you'd done a few weeks ago, isn't it, Nazmul? Yes, yeah, so uh, work around a search tool. Yes, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Nazmul Hussain, I'm a GP and currently the end of life clinical lead for Neom CCG. I'd like to, first of all, reintroduce the Mercury night nurses and the service they provide go over the early identification search tool which links in with the SNS for the proposed SNS for 2021-22 and how that can help you in your practice. 
and then go over teaching and education. Next slide, please. Can we play the video? Please. It's a very short video. There's no sound. I think you may have to go back, please. Hi, Maggie. We had no sound at all. OK, one second. Sorry. We did test it earlier, so... I was going to say, we tried it earlier. I do apologise, Nazmo. No problem. So whilst we're waiting, the maybe sorry, can you hear it now? No. No, we can't. Martin suggesting sharing the sound function. Should we move on now? We'll see if we can sort this out. Is that okay? Is that right, Masana? Yeah. yeah. At the moment it's not working, although we did test it as Kevin said. That's really okay if you continue the presentation and we'll try to get that on, or do you need do you need this one to be done first? Uh let's just give it one more shot. Sure. Okay, we'll try and come back to that if possible. Yeah, I mean it has got subtitles if you want to continue and just watch it. No, you need the sound that there's there is some auditory and um, auditory things that we would have. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. So the the Mercury service is is basically district nurses out of core hours, and they look after patients uh, who are on the palliative care register needs nursing care out of hours, for example, a catheter may have been blocked. Instead of sending patients to AMD, they can be referred into the Mary Curie service. You may have patients who live alone and quite frail, elderly. They can be linked in with the Mary Curie night service team and befriend those patients. The only thing that they ask is that patients have a, a CMC care plan. Um, we'll try and share that video, perhaps play at the end if possible, and we'll send you the link for that video. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, so the proposed SNS for 2021 and 22 relating to end of life is basically there is a search tool that we have developed in collaboration with colleagues in the Midlands and NHS England, and it's a search tool which should be present in all of your practices now through um, the CEG search folder and it identifies patients who are eligible for advanced care planning and the the specification for this one is to search for patients through the early identification search tool and clinically review these patients to support their care needs and conduct appropriate care planning. Post review Patients should also be added to the end-of-life register where clinically appropriate reviews can be done by face-to-face -face telephone video. Following the review, the practices should take appropriate actions, including discussing patients in MDT meetings, referral to appropriate elderly service clinics, and um, developing an advanced care plan, a CMC care plan if possible. And um, band A, there is some uh, funding associated with them. So 85% band A of eligible patients reported as having a review using the CAG template. And out of those 85, 5% uh, we expect to get the high payment to do an advanced care plan. What it means is for a list size of about 11, 12,000, 
maximum three or four care plans in the proposed nine months. For smaller practices, that equates to probably one uh, CMC care plan in the nine months. So I tried to negotiate the lowest numbers possible so colleagues can achieve the highest payment. And uh, given the COVID, I hope that is reasonable to all my colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. So CMC, doing a CMC care plan, there is also an additional payment to we are looking for high quality CMC care plans and you get 100 pounds to recompense your time and resources to do the care plan and also an additional 100 pounds uh, where patients die in their preferred place of care or death. So maximum 200 pounds payment to uh, appreciate your time and dedication to doing that care plan. And people ask me uh, a lot of the time, how can I do an advanced care plan in half an hour or 20 minutes? And the answer is, there's nothing to say that care plan needs to be done in one session. So many of the care plans I do are over weeks and sometimes go into months. So they're not completed in one session. I usually start off by introducing myself to the patient and the family and the relative, then subsequently follow patients up. And when it's appropriate, when patients are happy and content and want to have, to have that discussion, I pursue the, the conversations. And at the end, we complete the care plan and I give a copy to patients. Um, if you would like further training and education around how to access CMC, how to do a high quality advanced care plan, then by all means, we can provide that. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, the one before, please. If you go into your CG search folder, you should be able to download the early identification search tool. So this is the one that I run for my practice uh, a couple of months ago. Our list size approximately uh, then was nearly 11,000. Out of those 11,000, the search tool identified 49 patients who were suitable for advanced care planning. Out of them, two had cancer, 27 dementia or had severe frailty, one heart failure, one motor neuron disease, 11 with severe liver or kidney disease and, and five with um, respiratory problems. Not all of these patients will need an advanced care plan, um, but the advice is just to screen through the list and pick out those patients who are eligible or suitable and want to have that care plan, by all means contact them. Next slide, please. We've also developed a early identification uh, and personalized care plan toolkit. In that smart toolkit, there are lots of PDF links which will open up folders around letter templates, patient information leaflets, what to, packs to send out to patients to inform them about what is advanced care planning. There are lots of smart links around local services for um, patients who may benefit from this service. That I've sent a link and um, uh, um, email to Karen who can certainly circulate to all my colleagues. Next slide, please. Uh, teaching and education. So on Monday this week, uh, I presented at the Royal College uh, the early identification search tool and in collaboration with uh, Rosie here, he's the CQC inspector. We did a collaborative teaching session and presented what we had done. The main thing around the CQC aspect is the review around um, DNAR CPR is if there are any patients on your register who have learning disability and they've had an a CMC or some sort of advanced care plan done, I would urge practices to look into that and make sure that's been reviewed and a blanket policy of putting patients on uh, the register DNA CPR register without informing them or making sure that's not uh, making sure it's evidence on on the records is really important because CQC may come in and ask to go through your LD patients to see if any have advanced care plan when it was done when it was reviewed who the discussions had taken place with um, so so do that and that that's quite important because we had a case where a new patient had been moved to another hospital I think in South End and had been put on the DNAR status and had died without informing um, the relatives and they were quite upset and shocked and, and pursued a complaint. So um, if you do have patients who have had CMC care plans created in the past, it's not a problem. 
what they're asking is just to review that and make sure um, it's been refreshed and up to date. Uh, on Wednesday this week, we, we had a fantastic teaching session where uh, we had a, um, a training hub BTS multi-professional learning event where we had, I think, 96 uh, participants. And um, it, it was a fantastic session where it wasn't just based for GPs, it was BTS trainees, uh, you had your physiotherapist, occupational therapist, and all uh, multi-professional colleagues involved in, in the advanced care planning. And I thought that was really useful and I learned so much from that as well. So following on from that and from the feedback, we'll provide more sessions. Uh, it's always nice to meet in person and have the small group discussions, but because of COVID, we are a bit restricted. So we'll definitely follow up on that. And if there is any specific training need, you need as an individual a, a practice or a, as a group then inform myself or the um the training hub colleagues and you know, Kavita is here as well and we will try our best to facilitate that um and next slide we i think that's it from me and it is a colleague from uh, saint joseph's here i want to introduce our colleagues roxanne and anna from saint joseph's if they're here thanks nazmul i mean that's um Great work you've done, and um, this is the proposed SNS, which is starting in July. Is that is that correct, Jenny? Or well, Nazmul, if you can answer that. So this is it hasn't been finalized and stamped and sent out, but this is the proposed, and it obviously needs the stamp from Jenny uh, to go ahead. And and there's um the five percent is in all of the kind of the banding there in terms of you do a search and 5% have advanced care plans. Where does that 5% come from? Is that like from from your practice or what's the thinking behind it or the evidence? That, that There is no evidence. That is the lowest number I could negotiate. The number started off at 85% and I pushed it down and I pushed it down to 5% to help our colleagues. So it's either 5% to 85% and I tried my best so what it means actually in the nine months, instead of asking colleagues to do the 100% care plans, we're asking is try your best to do at least one CMC care plan. So you as a practice know how to do that when CQC come in or for patients as well. And if you need any help with CMC, then let me know. Uh, that is the lowest number I could go down to. Thank you for that, Nazmul. A bit of pragmatism in the kind of pandemic, I suppose. Um, Jenny, so this is from July, is that the proposal? I know I know it hasn't been finalised. Is that correct? Nadeem, I'm um, I'm going to be on doing a, an update on the SNSs, so can I pick it up as part of that? That's fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, just some feedback from Hazel about practices being penalised if they don't die in their place of death. That, that's place of, um, Preferred place, actually. That's not true. Uh, nobody will be penalised if a patient doesn't die in the preferred place of death. Circumstances change. Uh, patients on palliative care register may acutely deteriorate. They may need hospital admission, and that may be the best place for them to die. So that but is not do, true. But you do miss out on a payment, though. That that is true. Yes, so that is something beyond my control. It, it is how you code it. So when. A patient dies, you need to go back into CMC and then code where the patient died. Uh, you can obviously debate it with the CCG around the suitability, but that's for the individual practice to do. Yeah, I mean, I always wondered how that would look in a daily mail being um, paid to stop patients going into hospital. I mean, that's probably how the headline could go. But um... well, if you if you read the Daily Mail, then you can get worried. If you don't read the Daily Mail, it doesn't concern you. And we don't use Daily Mail as evidence based practice. So I, I can invite the Daily Mail to my practice and show them what we are doing. Right. <laughs> um, I'll see, I'll see any questions. So should we move on to um, the rest of the palliative team? Is it Dr. Well and Roxanne? No, uh, we are, uh, Roxanne is here. Hello, I'm here. Yes. Hi, Roxanne. Are you going to give us a I just wanted to introduce you to the St. Joseph's team. They do a fantastic work in the community, and I thought it'd be a nice to, for us to see them and what they look like and what they do in the community. <laughs> so thank you very much for taking the time to join us. No, no, it's okay. Thank you for inviting me. Hi, Roxanne. 
Yes, hi. So I'm the, the, the head of the community palliative care team. Um, we cover, obviously, um, patients living in New we're based at St. Joseph Hospice. Um, so we're a, a team that's made up of specialist nurses and doctors, um, palliative care doctors. Um, and of course, we have access to palliative care social workers and physio and dietitian that's based at, at, at the hospice and they can also um, see patients in the community. We complement the, the, the care um, for our patients in the community. So we get referrals from the hospital teams, GPs, um, like I said, we can have um, referrals from the patient as well as the, the relatives. But if that's the case, we have to link in with the GPs to see if that's, um, if that's OK, because the GP remains primary in, um, in charge of the patient's care. We just complement the care. So I just wanted to say hi, um, just say that obviously we link in, we work along with yourselves and the district nurses. We do attend your um, your GP meetings, your end of life palliative care meetings as well. So you'll meet somebody from the team there as well. And we also get lots of your input into the care homes. So thanks for that. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, we work with the care homes. Um, and um, of course, you have um, GPs have link into our doctors. We've got 24 seven ad, um, advice line um, that you can link into for one of our consultants if you need any advice. Okay, Hazel, um, hey, you've got your hand up. Hey, thanks, Nadine. Just quickly, I was saying, I suppose the MDT discussion is what would qualify the issues around the preferred place of death and if it changes. So I guess that can easily be built into it. Yes. Thank you. Can't see any hands up. Any questions on the chat bar, Karen? Only to try the video again, I think, really, <laughs> which um, I think it would be good if we can. Um, I know the team were just testing it out again. So but we have put the link in. So if by any chance it doesn't work, please do follow the link on your own. Time. Just one thing, Nadim, uh, I'm working very hard with our social prescribers and our pharmacists to upskill them around for the pharmacist, um, you know, doing the, the mar charts and uh, and writing up the anticipatory care medication, which I'm sure GPs will much appreciate. So pharmacists should be at the end, be able to present the chart to the GP and the prescription for them to sign and get the GP to second screen. And I'm sure that would save us a lot of time because I think they're really skilled and can identify potential interactions and all this read and monitoring stuff. So that's in the pipeline and also the social prescribers i'm quite we're working quite closely with them to make sure that they can also link patients who are palliative into the community services because there's a lots out there that we don't know about and when Nat natasha presented her 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 work and it was fabulous the, the sort of stuff that she was coming out with so i think there's lots of stuff to come around end of life which should take off a lot of pressure around gps and clinic clinicians having to do that stuff so those days are gone. I think we, we've got lots of fantastic additional role staff who can complement us. So what are your plans for the training of clinical pharmacists? Who are you doing that with? And so I'm I'm it's a project I'm working at the moment. It's just started. So I'll be linking with the training hub, Wajid, the prescribing team, um, and the the ELF and CCG. So everybody really, we want something that's standard and can be shared across all the networks and and um, it will be open to everyone so yeah and, and you're right the link between our staff and our new staff at our roles and all the services including palliative is really important um there's just a question of a request from roxanne to share the advice line number for the consultant please is that okay roxanne oh yes um so 24 um seven line number is um or 300 you do you want me to email, email it to you email, please that'd be great Shall I email it to um, Nasmal and then you can populate it? Sure, yeah. we'll put it yeah. in the chat bar and also email it and then we'll send it out. Okay, out? yep, chat bar. Okay, I'm going to try this. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I know sort of suggested in terms of um, yeah, pharmacists across the bow and regarding hospice. I suppose that's something we can take forward if needed. Thank, thanks for that, Nasmal. Any luck with the video, um, Karen? Just going to try it now. So I'm hoping, Nasmore, we, we did try it earlier and it worked. So it's going to be one of those days. 
every, every time I try this, it never works live. OK, so let me know if you can hear it now. Yeah. Or maybe we could just play it. Uh, there is a uh, uh, subtitle. Yes, yeah, so is there any sound coming out? Sorry. No, no. Just no. play it. Just play it. It's a service that's highly underutilized, and I really wanted colleagues to become familiar with the service and, and really optimize and get patients to benefit from the service. And just a reminder, how do we contact the service? Is there like a, a directory or is it in a directory or do we have a number? Uh, then there's a referral form and I'll give it, send it to Karen to circulate. We can attach it with the notes from the meeting. Yeah, th there's one form in which you can tick boxes. You can refer to St. Joseph's, uh, Mercury nurses, and also you can use that to inform the out of GP as well. Okay. It is another one or two minutes left. What are you saying here, Nathmur? I was just saying that some of our patients are, are extremely lonely. They don't have any family members. The only people that I have contact with is their carers and their GP. And it, sometimes it is quite tragic to see patients dying on their own at home, not having anyone to talk to and befriend. And I, I feel some of these patients are missing out on, on a huge amount of resources that's available in the community that we're not utilizing. And in terms of um, the links, um, I assume they've got links with rapid response team and care homes as well. Yes, yeah, care homes. And they'll come out to patients who are known to have advanced care plans and are palliative. Is that yeah. right? Well, yeah, yeah, so from 6.30 in the evening to 8 o'clock in the morning, they'll visit anyone who has an advanced care plan, adults, not children. Adults, okay. Yes, they can do remote uh, access to patients if they, that's what they prefer. Uh, they, they, they have lots of volunteers who uh, can go in and just talk to somebody who's feeling a bit lonely, anxious and scared about death. OK, I, I put in the link for the YouTube video, so have a look at that if you have time. Thank yeah, you. We'll send it out as well um, with the presentations. Thanks for that, Nazmul. Great work and um, keep, keep, keep it up with your um, end of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll get an SNS update from Jenny now. Hi, Jenny. Hi all. <laughs> Can I have my slides, please?
So just while we're waiting for these to come up, um, we've been uh, working with, uh, or we established a working group back in February um, to do a number of things. One was to um, talk about our principles and approach for uh, the SNSs in Newham uh, for this year. Um, and then over the subsequent weeks, um, there was input from the commissioning and clinical leads for each of the services that we have uh, commissioned historically, um, with a view to reviewing those in the light of uh, the last kind of year to 18 months. Um, so those service specifications have been reviewed um, both through the uh, working group and have been circulated to the members of the GP transformation subgroup as well to have a look at. Um, can I have my first slide please or my second? That's it. Um, so one of the um, things that we agreed to do quite early on was to help practices with their juggling of um, the, the kind of quite complex uh, commissioning arrangements we have at the moment. So as practices will be aware, we commission the uh, SNSs from the primary care networks, uh, although much of that is um, individual practice delivery. Um, and we also then commissioned, have historically commissioned practices um, as uh, to deliver the new outcome measures. So that was the PMS review um, equalisation arrangements. So as of the 1st of July this year, um, the equalised arrangements have got to a stage where they equalised. Um, and GMS and PMS are being paid the same um, in terms of uh, the investment having been equalised across the, the two uh, types of practice contracts. And so it didn't make sense for us to be commissioning the new outcome measures separately. So uh, we've incorporated those outcome measure indicators in the uh, suite of SNSs this year. Uh, practices will already have received a, uh, a letter from William Cunningham Davis, who's the uh, Director of Primary Care Transformation, confirming that uh, quarter one um, uh, will be income protected. Um, there is further discussion afoot about quarter two onwards um, and income protection, and I think we will have to keep the situation under review. But at this stage, we have given a commitment um, to uh, protect income in quarter one. Um, so the service specifications have been amended um, in the light of COVID and to adjust any changes that have happened either through nice guidance um, uh, or uh, evidence-based medicine that has come up since. Um, we had previously talked about increasing the overall PCN outcome goal for this year, but we've agreed that we will maintain that at 10%. Um, and we have also agreed that the SNSs will be synchronised with the financial year. So colleagues will remember uh, for the last couple of years that they've started on the 1st of July and finished on the 30th of June. This year they will start on the 1st of July and they'll finish on the 31st of March. So that come the 1st of April next year, we will have a full financial year. We've also committed, uh, once services go live, to continue having the uh, working group meetings uh, on a quarterly basis to review the progress of arrangements and deal with any uh, specific issues that are coming up um, from feedback, um, both from practices and PCNs themselves. Next slide, please. Um, so we are in the process of finalising um, the, uh, uh, the, the documentation to send out to practices. Um, we've also reviewed uh, the, the kind of goal setting um, and colleagues will remember that there were thresholds included for each of the services previously. What we have done is taken a baseline 
of um, uh, of uh, achievements by practices um, uh, over the last uh, year or so, and we have reviewed those thresholds based on where practices are now as a result of um, the pandemic response. Um, we will take another baseline at the end of this month um, to see if the thresholds we have proposed for the 1st of Ju July onwards um, are right or whether we're off kilter. Um, and we will continue to uh, monitor that over the uh, course of the next few months. Um, what practices will then receive from us is a summary guide, which will um, confirm in, in uh, really kind of hopefully uh, uh, practice in a very practice and PCN friendly way, the uh, changes that have been made to the existing um, to the existing services from last time to to this time. So practices will have a, a summary kind of service specification to look at in that pack if they want to remind themselves of the full details. If they're comfortable with the full details of the services and they don't want to look at the whole uh, service specification, the summary guide will provide that summary. Um, of uh, what is being commissioned this year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide reflects uh, all of the uh, services that we are looking to commission this year. Uh, we have had a late proposal to also include the low calorie diet um, arrangements in this. Um, we, uh, I think I need to have a, uh, a conversation with Tammy about that. I think um, one or two colleagues have talked about the fact that uh, this list alone feels uh, pretty overwhelming um, in the light of uh, the, the kind of uh, backlog of patients that are coming through to see you at the moment. But hopefully those services will be very familiar uh, to you. Uh, based on what we've commissioned um, in previous years. Uh, so they might be a uh, low calorie diet um, added to that list. Uh, that was something that NHS England were, have provided the funding for and are very keen for us to uh, pilot this year. Um, and there'll be further news about that. Um, and then on to the, what I think is the last slide. Um, yes, yeah, so just uh, a reminder of what I've mentioned. So uh, the specification is being finalised this month and will come out to you with a summary guide. Um, the services will start on the 1st of July uh, and run through uh, for nine months to the 31st of March um, with ongoing review through the course of those nine months. CEG will continue to, uh, to support in the way they have been. So they are uh, tweaking templates and searches uh, on the basis of uh, any changes made to commissioning arrangements. Um, the dashboard information um, will be uh, consolidated. That's something we've asked uh, CEG to do. So previously, practices and PCNs received one dashboard for SNSs and a different one for the outcome measures. We've asked them to include everything in the one dashboard. Um, and uh, as in previous years, the CCG, uh, sorry, the CEG will do um, a session just to update practices. Um, kind of soon into uh, the new year uh, so that practices are clear about uh, searches and templates. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Uh, so Tammy, you have your hand up. So I think I've got two points, Jenny, just um, again about the prioritisation so that we have some idea to tell practices, you know, sort of what are our priorities in you as we work through that SNS um, uh, list. And I think it's quite difficult for us to know exactly what we should be focusing on if we're going to be sort of um, still trying to deliver the CVP. Um, so I think that that's still a piece of work that's going on. And whilst we've, you know, we've got this 
we're working collaboratively that doesn't still doesn't mean that we're all agreeing so and um, we're still looking in, uh, at um, you know sort of ways of making this useful to practices and for us to prioritize and then the second point was just about the LCD that it's about us being able to pay you for the work that you're doing so just to align um, with what's happening in in Nell it's nothing that's going to be performance managed but we do need a, a, some a way of being able to pay you for the work that you're doing around the LCD so looking at it with a slightly positive tilt as opposed to negatively so hopefully Jenny will take that conversation further offline but um, it was about aligning to what we were doing in, in, in NEL uh, to make sure that we're paying practices for the work because there is additional work that goes with that. But it is a great intervention for those eligible patients. Thanks. Thank you. So you've got um, the working group who are reviewing it, Jenny, and I think you've got LMC and CD and practice manager engagement or in that group. Is that correct, Jenny? That's right, Nadine. Um, um, and then that working group have been feeding back into the GP transformation subgroup. Yep, and income protection for the first quarter, so that's until July. Um, that's fine. And is is there a kind of an equalisation process across NEL? Or is it the same SNSs across NEL, or how is it working? Because we're we're kind of moved on from new MCCD, haven't we? Or across TNW? Yes, so there are two um, service specifications uh, that have been uh, consistently applied so far. One for NEL, which is the enhanced healthcare in care homes arrangement, which is for nursing and re residential older people's homes. And that's over and above um, what PCNs are being asked to deliver as part of the network des arrangements. Um, for the first time ever this year, we have actually developed a medicines optimization scheme which covers all three of the TNW boroughs. So we had um, very different arrangements. Well, last year we uh, had the same arrangements for Newham and Wolf and Forest, but we paid at different levels uh, and a separate arrangement for Tower Hamlets. This year we're looking to have the same arrangement across the three with a consistent payment um, across uh, all three. Uh, boroughs and there is a piece of work going on um, which is being led by the NEL team um, which we're also involved in which is looking very specifically at um, three areas so one is safeguarding um, one is phlebotomy and one is uh, I think what we previously referred to as um, urgent primary care stroke duty doctor scheme um, so those will be the first three um, areas that are prioritised for the uh, Liz Les equalisation group that's meeting across NEL. A letter went out from the NEL team um, inviting expressions of interest from anyone interested in being on that group. The group will be chaired by um, a GP from uh, completely outside of the area, um, Mark Spencer. Um, and uh, we can certainly feed back the uh, progress of that group sure. uh, in future. Thanks for that. Um, I can see Laura's got a hand up. Just give me one, one more question. Sorry. So we've got equalisation of PMS and GMS, you said, by July. Um, in terms of equalisation across NEL, or specifically kind of TNW and Tower Hamlets, and um, have we got like a target date for that? Well, uh, I think we did have some target milestones. Um, mm. our, our first one is around making sure that we're equalising Waltham Forest with Newham, um, because Waltham I mean, Forest, uh, now, you know, we're and, we're and, and Havering <laughs> with, oh, with the rest of now. Newham's going to stay the same with Waltham Forest, because Waltham Forest has got to come up, but I suppose I'm wondering about um, Newham patients getting the same offer as Tower Hamlet. Yeah, I mean, that that will continue to be work in progress over the coming months and probably years, actually. Um, and um, last thing before I go to Laura, face-to-face um, -face is quite topical at the moment in terms of um, patients accessing face-to-face -face appointments if needed. I'm not sure if, if that includes clinical need. Um, what's the kind of CCG advice? Um, sometimes we have been getting kind of 
push towards online triage, total triage over the past year of the pandemic, telephone, video, and great work being, uh, that has been done with Active for instance. So what, what's the kind of... I'm going to bring Sabir in um, on this as well, because um, he and I have had a conversation about this this week. He's so a I think CQC are coming, isn't he? So yeah. So I so uh, I think I have said before, and I fed back that the GP contract advice prior to anything that Nikki Kanani sent out more recently um, uh, in correspondence to practices was that it was, and I, I suppose this was to do with the. Um, the restarting of COF on the 1st of April, that it is up to the practice to determine what is most clinically appropriate um, for patients in terms of seeing them face to face. The recommendation is that patients with uh, dementia are seen um, on a face to face basis. But other than that, it's for the practice to decide. Having said that, I will say that there has been, we've been asked um, uh, a few awkward questions um, about um, percentages of face-to-face -face versus, um, versus online consultations that are being done. Um, and we've tried, um, so, you know, I know for some practices we've come out and spoken to you about it just to get your perspective, um, but we're really not intending to um, to be ticking anybody off for having the right or wrong proportion of face-to-face -face okay. versus uh, online. Thank you, Jenny. Laura. I think, but I'm sorry. The the one thing I will say though is uh, is absolutely key. Is although we will leave you to use your clinical judgment about assessing whether you see a patient face to face or not it is absolutely crucial that patients understand that your door is open and that they can contact reception 8 a.m to 6 30 p.m monday to friday so um and it and it's it's where practices um are keeping their their doors very firmly shut and giving patients the impression that they're not open for business, I think is um, kind of perhaps giving patients mixed messages. I know if Claire Davison was on the call, and I'm not sure she is, that she would be able to give a really clear perspective from what's happening in unscheduled care and the increased numbers of patients who are turning up at UTC, um, saying that they've come along because they couldn't access their own GP practice and that may or may not be correct. Um, and there's a specific piece of work we're doing with three um, three practices who are showing um, seemingly high attendances at the UTC just to understand what's happening there. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. Any Laura, put your hand up. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I guess that sort of leads on quite well to my earlier question about support for practices with on the day care, urgent care, because I'm really pleased to see that that's going to be focused on because um, I think you are right, Jenny. I think there's obviously different practices across Newham and beyond nationally about what access looks like. And I presume there are similar veins of why some practices will say, sorry, we're full. You've got to go to the urgent care centre, whereas some other practices will say, well, we're open for we're open for business all day on call. I mean, I can only talk about my own practice and we've always got open access online to telephone, but we're, we're, we're really struggling um, in terms of the on-call access. So we're on call obviously until 6.30. Anything that comes into us that's urgent up until 6.30, we deal with it. But it's not sustainable and it's starting to feel like we really need some extra support. Now, obviously, there's lots of internal things that you can do to try and um, help that. But obviously what it all comes down to is then that means that the routine care, care gets massively pushed back. Some of it very appropriately, but some of it maybe not. Um, and I know that obviously other areas um, have already done quite a lot of work on this already with contracts put out for an on-call duty doctor. Quite a lot of money uh, put into that so that the feds can actually support the practices with that. I think um, I think the hackney one is that there's actually an on-call on doctor contract, which means that anything that's urgent coming into the practices in hours, they get a call back within two hours. And, you know, we don't, we've got the hub appointments, but we don't have that much utilisation of them. And certainly when, when we're 
when when we're open, we don't really get the access to them that would protect, you know, potentially help with that. But what's happening now is that we've got, you know, all of us, partners, salary doctors, everyone in the practice is, we're, we're buckling under it. And so I think it's brilliant that we're actually going to be doing this. But what we're going to be doing in the short term, because I presume that this isn't going to happen for the next year or so, but what support can we get for our practice staff at the moment? Because, you know, like I say, we're open from seven in the morning till 6 30 at night and anything that comes in we deal with but it's not sustainable so i really want to hear from other practices about what we can try and do to try and you know do something about this because i think this is a real priority at the moment i think you really nicely summarized the kind of the pressure um, and the issues we're having in primary care in terms of online face to face you can't you can't one person can't do it all and also if you do more acute stuff you do push back the routine stuff um, and, and so they are, and um, so thanks for that. Claire, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, no, um, I actually didn't hear everything that Laura said because I just had a call from um, from the UTC managers <laughs> saying that they're in absolute crisis as well. Um, so they had 30 breaches yesterday, which is sort of unheard of in UTC. So, you know, the whole system is completely screwed at the moment. And I think there are three things. I think one of them is is just pressure everywhere um uh the online consultation and the remote consultation um is not received well by all and i think it diverts a lot into one on one so i know laura and the northeast london digital team were looking at the algorithms and stuff um you've got the outpatient and the hospital access as specialist access which is tipping in into primary care and then you've got one on one which is just then sending everybody everywhere. So I think what's happening is we've got patients churning through the system, having four contacts and then getting one output. So whilst the system's under such pressure, it's also being incredibly inefficient and ineffective. Um, so we are talking about some proposals and actually Laura in the urgent care working group, we put, um, we put a proposal through for duty doctor because I'd heard about the Hackney system a couple of years ago and it, and it was supported. Um, and so we are thinking that we should have a duty doctor working with rapid response. So, for example, I went to the shadow rapid response. It was actually a morning when um, LAS went to one of your patients and LAS, it was, he was 100 years old and they wouldn't leave him, even though it was clearly a UTI. And you said you can leave him. And they said, well, by the book, we can't leave him. And the rapid response nurse said, well, I can't leave him because I don't want to risk my sort of registration. We need the GP oversight. So they ended up they ended up getting PRU actually, but that would have been ideal if there'd been a GP working with rapid response so they can fill in the gaps for primary care when literally they just can't do the stuff, you know. So okay. um, there are lots of there are lots of ideas in the system. I think as far as primary care, I did raise it on the North East London call yesterday and I think I didn't manage to get to the LMC meeting, but William said that he was hoping to discuss it with the LMC. I think everybody recognises there's huge pressure. There are no quick and easy answers, but I do think if we can sort out the online algorithms okay. so that patients aren't battered so quickly into 111, and if we can find a different way of filtering 111, I, I have no impact on the unplanned care system and the outpatient management. Potentially, if we could use advice and guidance and get enhanced support for primary care to have advice and guidance restreaming all the referrals, but that's not my game, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thanks, Claire, for that. No, thanks. Can I just, sorry, Nadine, can I just come back a second? Like, it's, um, it's difficult. I think uh, the, 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 the online triage part is part of it, but I still haven't seen a whole deal of evidence to suggest that the total triage um, practices and the, the patients that use the online forms, that that's a main reason why people are going to urgent care centre. I haven't seen that. I know that our own uh, records show that since we started online triage, we've got less presentation there compared to years before. Um, but certainly I know that there are some, there's definitely, like you say, every single system is under pressure. But I'm not, so, I'm not sure it's so much about that. It's just that everyone's under pressure, but we certainly are. So we need that help in terms of if we're supposed to be open for access between those hours, but it means that our doctors are seeing what feels unsafe. What are we doing about that? I, so I'm, I'm not so much talking no, about I, the urgent care side. I'm talking about primary GP. No, I, I agree. I agree. Though. I think there's a lot. No, of, it's symptomatic of this. There's a lot of. Like, no, no, it's just weakness in the legs. 
but it doesn't it doesn't feel warm. Did we go on mute? Did we go on so mute? It's not so it's not so so it's, sure. it's just a demon. Yeah. Yeah, Ma Maggie, can we mute them one more time? Um, yeah, in terms of, um, you're right, Laura, there's a lot of pressures, Jenny and Laura, in the system. Yeah. And I think, I don't think there is a silver bullet. We've tried online triage, we've tried, you know, telephone. I don't, 111 has been tried. Um, it might just be that we, we need more resource into the system to take um, away some of these pressures. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, you can come back with some solutions with um, the CCG and um, the Fed if needed and clear. But uh, I think, I'm not sure there's that many more, there's that much more you can get out of primary care, to be honest, not from the feedback we're getting. Um, so A and G is fine, but again, that's going to be more pressure on practices. If you if people aren't going to hospital, then you have to see them more. Um, and often it's just a load of tasks to be done and follow up, and actually it's more work. Um, so I don't think there's a silver bullet um, in terms of technology or what we what we can do differently in primary care at the moment locally. And I think we'll have to move on from that. I know you've got your, your hand up wax, but I think we have got another presentation. I don't want to run too late. So we'll move on to the next presentation, which is our public health and LBN colleagues, Hi, Jyoti, um, who are going to give us an update on weight management services. Hi, Jyoti, and we've also got Jayman here, and you've got a presentation. Yeah. Hi, hi, everyone. Nice to meet everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jyoti and um, I'm the new commissioner for uh, the Weight Management Service and um, and the Services Commission through GPs, the P Public Health Services Commission through GPs. Uh, most of you may have met uh, my my uh, my manager, Kieran Scott, um, and and after Kieran, it was John Curry who was um, sort of you know leading on the uh, public health uh, contract. Uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm basically um, the new commissioner. And uh, we are here to talk to you about the new uh, tier two weight management service, which was commissioned um, this year in uh, Jan, early this year. And um, this has been um, a service which we've been wanting to commission quite some time, uh, but finally, um, thanks to COVID, we managed to um, commission it. Um, my my colleague Jamin would talk a little more about this, but um, you know, just just very quickly, wanted to. Um, uh, let you guys know that you know uh, we are ex like you know we would really appreciate um, referrals coming into the service from GPs. Um, so all the forms and everything is on emails, and um, yeah, uh, if if we do if you do need more information about this, please feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, but you know, without uh, talking much, I'll just let uh, Jamin give you an, a quick introduction about the service. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for thanks for hosting us today. Really appreciate it. I know we've got a, a little short allocated time today, so so very grateful. Um, yeah, so as, as Jodi mentioned, I mean, you know, this this service has sort of just, you know, been launched uh, this year and it's really just raising awareness amongst the community, amongst yourselves about what's what's available. Um, and uh, as you can see, we've um, uh, we've got a little presentation here, a little slideshow, and it says Mashopi on there, who's my colleague, who is meant to be delivering today uh, this this uh, presentation, but unfortunately he has to, he's not able to make it, so I'm going to step in last minute and and hopefully try and fill his shoes. So um, what we'll do is we'll I'll quickly run through the the the, the presentation with yourselves, and and hopefully we'll have some time for some Q and A at the end as well. So. Essentially, what 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 is this? So as as Jodi mentioned, this is a tier two weight management service recently commissioned. It's a free twelve week program for the residents of Newham. Um, at the moment, obviously due to the COVID you know restrictions uh, that that have been placed upon us, um, that we are delivering the the service remotely uh, via platforms such as Microsoft Teams, and we've got some video conferencing um, uh, sort of platforms available as well. Um, if we can maybe just click on to the next. But then, oh, there we go. So the program, it's it's a culturally appropriate program that combines nutrition, physical activity, and psychology to achieve sort of long long term behavior change. You know, within the, the patients, um, the service users are fully supported. You know, by our team, by the health and well being coaches throughout their journey. Um, the the program is actually developed and and sort of been devised and created by our own MDT sort of team, uh, which consists of dietitians. Um, psychologists and exercise specialists um, and as it says it's all supported uh, with you know they're, they're all supported with the 12 online uh, learning modules um, at the moment like I said it's all remote 
Um, and we also have like other resources available, such as an app um, and like a manual um, and various other sort of um, mechanisms we use, such as um, uh, podcasts and uh, peer group sort of um, blogs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yep. Can we have the next slide? Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So the eligibility criteria. This is. I guess fairly straightforward. So to be eligible, um, the, the, the patient needs to be over 18. Um, they need to be a Newham resident and have a BMI of 25 or over, or um, if they're from sort of like the, the BAME community, black, Asian or minority, uh, ethnic minority, then that's lowered to uh, 23. Um, so th th there are some, so we've tried to sort of make this program as accessible as you know possible for, f for as many people. Um, there are some exclusion criteria. So, as you may be, as some of you may be may be aware, Zyla also um, run the or have been commissioned to to run the Na National Diabetes Prevention Program along with the Diabetes Remission Program, the Low Calorie Diet Service. So, if the patient is already enrolled onto one of those, then they wouldn't be eligible. Um, likewise, pregnant women it goes without saying they they wouldn't be um, eligible either. Um, or if you identify that the person obviously has like an underlying medical cause for their obesity, then also they wouldn't be suitable either. Um, and likewise, if they've if the patient's already sort of um, um, accessed uh, the, a, a different tier two weight management service twice within the, within the year, then that would also exclude them as well. Um, is there another? Should we move on to the next slide? Brilliant. Okay, so the referral pathway. So how to refer? So Jodi um, just touched upon this a little while ago. So basically, the healthcare provider to check the eligibility of the patient, just discuss the program with them to make sure you know that they are motivated and it's something that they would like to take part in, obviously. Um, and then you know you guys can sort of just refer uh, through your through your systems already um, through EMIS um, by using the same form as you as you would to refer to the 150 club. Um, there has been a slight amendment to that, and it's that form has been updated to include our service as well. So there's just like a little tick box there uh, for the weight management service. So once that's sort of sent through, it will be sort of forwarded or, or triaged accordingly. Um, also, there is a self referral option as well. So appreciate you guys are really, really busy and under pressure, uh, as we've all clearly heard, um, and you may not have that time to sort of spend spend with the patient. So, you know, although we want to, if it's possible, we'd appreciate it coming directly from you. But as we all know, you know, we, it's not possible. And there is a self referral route as well. So you can sort of um, direct them to to our website as well. And I can, you know, we can forward you all the relevant details. Hopefully we're trying to sort of um, get all this information out to your practices as well. So there should be posters and leaflets available um, for patients to sort of, you know, pick up for themselves. Um, next slide, please. So the, the service model um, in a nutshell, basically once they've been referred to us, they will then be uh, booked in for their initial assessment. So this is with uh, this is a one to one session with the, the health and wellbeing coach. Just gives us a chance to really build that rapport and, and relationship with the patient, um, you know, using motivational interviewing techniques, et cetera, just to get that buy in from from the patient. Um, and then they will go through their 12 weeks with us. Um, and after the 12 weeks, it doesn't stop there. We provide additional support for a further three months. Um, and then uh, ultimately at the end, after the six months, um, that's when we have the final assessment and the person would be discharged. Um, next slide. Fab. OK, so what does the program consist of? So yes, it's a weight management program, but it it comprises of three elements. Um, the first one being the, the eating well components. Obviously, it, this is to do with the whole nutrition side of thing, educating um, the, the, the patients around healthy eating, making healthier choices, um, et cetera. Then we've got the moving more components. So this is the physical activity side of things. And as we know, physical activity goes hand in hand with, with good, good with, you know, with a good diet to help with weight loss and just general health and well-being. And then finally, we've got the taking charge component, which is um, which is like the the sort of behavior change side of things and uh, and mindfulness and and ultimately like the holistic part of the program. Uh, and then, oh, there we go. Okay, that was less than I expected. So Q and A. So I'm not sure if we've got some some time for some some questions. If if Thanks feel free to, um, to ask away, and I'll try my best. Thanks for that really good presentation. In terms of um, 
BMI of 25 or 23 if you're BAME, I mean, that's a lot of potential patients in Newham. What, what's your capacity like? So our capacity, we we would um, we've been commissioned to see um, four thousand patients throughout the year. Mm-hmm. At the moment, because it's it's a fairly new service, we are trying to raise this awareness amongst yourselves. So you know, we to be honest, we we're nowhere near that that capacity that figure yet. I mean, at the moment, we've received around six hundred referrals, um, and so yeah, there really isn't. Um, any sort of issue with with accepting referrals at the moment so please do by all means mm. you know feel free and how do you um where are you, where are you getting your referrals from at the moment is it mainly gp or is it through other ways yes yeah, so at the moment it's they're actually mainly self-referrals so it's through social media um as well as you know some of the other um sort of uh, community organizations we've linked in with um, some of the other healthcare workers social prescribers but it's it's all generally mainly um self self referrals and it's been tailored to our kind of new clients has it in terms of culturally appropriate yes yes exactly exactly that so for example you know we we are putting on sort of like language specific or even gender specific um sessions um it, the, the the program is actually underpinned um, by co-production work with residents and other external stakeholders to make sure you know as we all know that the community is very diverse you know different cultures different religions um so you know there's we've got culturally reflective food plates um food menus and, and online cooking demonstrations, which we're actually working on at the moment as we talk. So we have tried, you know, we have recognised this and tailoring the, the programme towards those specific cohorts. Okay. Um, and then just a request for promotional material in terms of um, your services, posters and so. Um, I'm just not sure, if, is there any kind of HRX text message that we have in primary care for this, Tammy? Oh. There is. Oh, yes, great. you do. That's hi, Damon. Hi, hi, Damon. Yeah. Hi. So just to say, this isn't. This, so this is a reminder, guys. Okay. That, so we have been promoting this for a while. Okay. So this is the one that kind of. Um, um, so February, February twenty one. We kind of rolled this out. Okay. So we've got a year, and we've we've got about six hundred referrals so far, and we've got a lot of space, and we don't want to waste that. So I think the really important thing to say is that this is not linked to any long term condition. As long as patients meet the eligibility criteria uh, in the, the BAME and have the, or or white with a certain um, BMI, it's fine. And just to clarify. G- they, patients with a history of GDM, we do really want to encourage them to go through the program if they don't want to do NDPP. I think that's really important distinction. And that also they may have done NDPP in the past, but it, they are still eligible for this program. So it's, it, it doesn't um, exclude them because they've been through NDPP before. So, um, Thanks. yes, there is an AccuRx message. And um, there's lots of information on the website and Damon and team will definitely be disseminating more information for you to give to our patients so that they are aware of the programme. And I think that's really important because we do have a couple of other things that are going on in the in the borough and at a nil level around weight management. And it's just to make sure that we are for well versed so that we don't get confused and can signpost the appropriate patient to the service that fits them. Um, and yes, this is the one that's probably most culturally appropriate for us. So it's really good to, to support it. Sure. And also, is it part of the EMIS template? So we're going to restart SNS soon and long term conditions often patients have a need for this. So is it is it part of the template in terms of a reminder for clinicians on the day or what? So anybody who needs a, anyone who needs a primary prevention review, as, as Jamie was saying, we've updated the referral form. So um, anyone that you're going to think about either referring to NDPP, this is now on that referral form as well. OK, so that you, you can have that discussion. And that's primarily um, our healthcare assistants and our nurses that are doing that. But obviously any HCP that comes in, in um, comes into contact with the patient who would be eligible, please socialise it. And obviously our social prescribers and clinical pharmacists as well need to be fully aware and they have been involved. Oh, sorry, the question was about long-term conditions. So I, I assume people with long-term, long-term conditions which, who are not diabetic or pre-diabetic can also access this service. 
Yes, so it's, it's yeah. not it's not it's not attached to any long term position. So they they could have one, and this is a good program for them, or they may not have one. So as long as they meet the eligibility criteria, and it's about trying to have a a healthier newum in that there is an intervention about people making lifestyle changes bef upstream before they actually become pre-diabetic or before you know they get any other long-term condition that this is um something that is available to them now okay thank you um thanks for that um any other can't see any other questions karen um any other questions for our speakers no, not on the weight management service. Um, and I think most of the others were reflecting the conversations um, that Laura was raising. No worries. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming down. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Well, um, I think that's it, really. We're um, running a bit late. So we'll um, see you all next month then. Bye.